Now, hopefully, uh, you've already read both short stories, The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry and Fish Chic by Amy Tan. Now, let's get right into analyzing these two short stories. Now, uh, okay. The Gift of the Magi is written by an author. An author or the writer is called William Sidney Porter. Uh, he was born uh, in 1862 and he died in 1910. So with knowing the, the author's uh, birth and what do you call birth and death, you actually can know a lot about the period. Okay. So because you can't write about the future unless it's a like fantasy novel or dystopian, but see, it already gives you a clue that the setting of the story should be in during the 19th century. Okay. And uh, with this name, William Sidney Porter is not in the work, right? You actually saw uh, what we call the pen name Nampaka, uh, which is O. Henry instead. Uh, and he has quite a fascinating story uh, because he started writing in jail. Uh, and the reason he was in jail because he he's con he was convicted of stealing money from the bank he worked for. So think of a bank robber. Bank robber. He's a bank robber, you can say. But maybe it's not like as serious as give. I have a gun. Give me the money. Maybe not that serious. Maybe just yak yak sap. <laughs> Who knows? Now, after the prison, he lived in New York. Ah, so where he lived also indicates the influence or at least influenced the setting of the story so he's an American you get you get to hear Americans value in culture uh, and he he's also quite known for his twisted surprising ending so sometimes with short stories another elements that that is what do you call differentiate itself from either fable folktale why is it not just tell why is it short story well the ending sometimes it's open-ended sometimes it's uh what do you call has such twisted or surprising or some even say like that's the purpose of short story to to what do you call to make you feel unexpected to to have like these interesting endings okay and uh, actually, I know you've already read these two stories, but in case you haven't, please think about these questions, okay? In general, so on what occasions do you give or exchange gift? We might not celebrate Christmas um, as, what do you call it, as predominantly as in the Western culture, but at least during New Year, uh, most people, or like our parents at least, will give presents right and it might actually be like imperial cookies in a round tin eh? or if you don't <laughs> uh if that's like not not uh what do you call oriental it could be like then I, I don't remember the brand but they look like very similar and i always confuse these two brands you know ah, and what about this what is the best gift you have ever received who gave it to you and why do you like it? So I might ask this in class. So be prepared to answer in order to get that precious 10% participation points. Okay. I will give you love points only if you interact with me. Okay. Now, how do you normally choose a gift for someone? Mm, think about that. If it's someone you know, it's quite easy. You know what they like or don't like, but what about strangers? What about uh, like the janitors, or it could be like oh yeah, la, at the security guards, for example. How do you normally choose the gift? Hmm. Ha does it always have to be expensive? Hmm. That's also something to think about. And for if you do not have any money at all, or, and you want to give a gift out, what will you do? Hmm. For like. And I like this for the young generation, okay? Sometimes it's the, what do you call, effort that counts. Some people, like, in my generation, okay, uh, some people, what do you call, like, 
uh, do origami, which is folding papers into shapes of like animals, such as birds, and they put this in like a jar. And give to that person. Ah. So with your generation, it could be other things also. It could be like a collage of photos, like a board. Could be a card. Who knows? Tell me. I want to know what new people think. Like what the young generation thinks about gifts. Uh, but okay, let's get into the story now. I've already told you about those two, those three elements, right? In short stories, can you pick that up? Can you analyze the stories? Not not in a way that oh, like this signifies something. It it maybe like the what do you call it? the character is actually an orphan and he feels insecure. Not that deep, okay? Just pick up these what do you call core elements or simple elements first. You have to be able to tell the characters, be able to describe them, and what I'm teaching right now is just one way of looking. At these elements, okay. You might feel differently. It's okay. Tell me why do you think it's different? Maybe it's, uh, the villain in the story. Uh, like here, we we use characteristics, right? Like a uh, selfish or or like uh, not caring for others. But you might feel different from me. You might say actually this character is. He uh he's not selfish, but he he actually look he's actually looking for himself. It means he actually takes care of himself first, which is also necessary in the modern world. Uh, who knows? Maybe you. So as long as you have, you can support your idea with what is shown in the text in the stories. Then that's fine. The support, the evidence is important. Okay. Well, you've got two characters. You've got Della, who's beautiful, hardworking, dedicated, loving, and caring. And you cannot describe these characters unless you've read the stories. Okay, and uh, we'll see. You don't know if the story will be asked in a midterm or not. So at least you should. At least, not like maybe you may not remember every line in the story, but should, you should be able to refer to incidents, things that happen in the story when you want to support that. Okay. Oh, she's dedicated and hardworking because she she doesn't just sit at home and be a housewife. She also works and find extra money for the family. Use these sentences to describe. Okay. She's also round and dynamic. Ah. So explain that. Why do you think she's round and dynamic? Oh, because at the beginning, she seems like a, uh, maybe just an ordinary housewife person. But in the end, we've also learned that, oh, she also, what do you call, go the extra miles. She does like extra things. She's actually like uh, not just ordinary person. She really has a big heart. Who knows? Ah. Explain that. Okay. And Jim, ah, here, see, Jim, he's hardworking also, dedicated, loving, caring. So quite similar to this, okay? But you can say that if Della, if what you see is in the story and are mostly uh, Della's character, they made Della's action from the beginning to the end, and then you see her transformation, then you can say, see, these examples show that Della is round and dynamic, but... In contrast, you see Jim's character. He only appears at the beginning and at the end, right? He's just like part of the character. He's like the reason why Del Della did these things, for example. Ah, then you can say that Jim is flat and static, not because like Jim is a bad person, but only that we only get to see Jim like a few times, like or like why am I keep like call it like um wella on air me noy uh air time me noy ah. That's like in common terms, uh, but see, sometimes you don't get to see other sides of that character. Then you can say that the weak point of this story is that Jim's character is quite flat and static. Okay. Now, think about what they do. This is what drives the story ahead. This is the plot. These these actions constitute the plot of the story. Okay. What do they do? Well, you see, Jim is a clerk or an officer, at least, uh, from what, how he described his work. And Della, 
Well, she's a housewife, housewife, but she's also a part-time worker. See, extra diligent. And think about it. How did Della get extra money? Well, she sold her hair. See, a hair, like which is like a a very important thing for women. Okay, and she sold her hair. That does signify something. That tells something about who ha, who Della is. Okay. Now, who is the protagonist? It means who got the most airtime in simple terms. Who's the protagonist? Well, we can see that Della is a protagonist. But if you ask who is the antagonist, well, there's no apparent villain. There's no apparent. Uh, Nang tua rai ni jema top Della. Bomi ne, bomi, tidak ada tua rai jema top Della. Tapi, kenapa Della harus terakram? Tung, oh, she overcome challenges ni. Oh. อะไรที่มาแบบขัดขวางเดลล่าไม่ให้ถึงจุดหมายของเดลล่าอืมอะไรล่ะก็จนไงแล้วจนแล้วเรียกว่าอะไรล่ะอะไรกันแทกันนิสมันคือ financial status ไงคะว่าเพราะไม่มีตังค์จึงต้องไปทํานู่นทํานี่เพราะไม่มีตังค์จึงทําให้เดลล่าต้องดิ้นรนต้องทํานู่นทํานี่เห็นไหม financial status เป็นแอนแทกันนิสก็ได้ไม่ต้องเป็นคนเห็นไหม Also, อะไรเพราะมันเป็น Christmas time คือทําไมจะต้องกระเสือกกระสนหาตังค์มาให้ได้ตอนนี้ก็มันช่วงคริสต์มาสมันเป็นช่วงที่เขาให้ของขวัญกันจริงไหมดังนั้น uh, so Christmas time is the season where people give gifts to each other that might be a good thing but it's also a pressure what do you call a pressure for people to find the means to get the gift because it's customary to do so uh. and think about the conflict what conflict does the protagonist have well One thing is her desire. She wants to buy something, right? That's her desire. The object of that is her desire. But her financial status is here. She can't reach that point where she can buy things that she wants, right? Because of her financial status. So that's the conflict, and she has to overcome steps like ladders until she reaches her desire. See. And from the stories, we also learned about their relationship. Think about that when you read their conversation, their dialogues in the story. Do you think they love each other still after the events of the story? Means when at the end, you see like the resolution already. But can you anticipate if they will still stay together or will they get a divorce? Okay. So you should also be able to not exactly predict the future, but at least infer what could happen in the future. Okay. Well, if you read the story, hopefully you did. You will know that they have true love for each other, really, huh? and that they sacrifice their most precious possession to buy the best of all possible gift for their love. So uh, they don't just. Uh, What do you call like work and work and work just to buy like uh, maybe ah I'll buy a bar of soap <laughs> or like ah I'll buy ah God Christmas not just ordinary things best possible gift for another person because they love each other they want what what the other person want okay and yes they love each other more ah like, uh, not divorcee because their love are proved in this event so maybe they don't just say I love you every day but this is the action they've bought each other gifts that shows their great sacrifices well so you could infer that they love each other more because of this event now what are their priceless things ah uh, when you read the story you should see that Priceless means, and um, what do you call that? You can't put price on that thing. It values so much, like in their mind. Okay, it values so much that they wouldn't want to sell that thing to others. Okay, priceless cannot give price to. Okay, won't sell. So for Jim, it's Jim's gold watch. See, and for Della, it's her long, beautiful hair. See, you see the difference here, right? But both of them are willing to sacrifice for Della her hair and for Jim his gold watch to give each other's gifts. See, and the gifts that they bought for each other, <laughs> comb, which is for Della's hair, and 
The golden watch, what do you use with a watch? It's not just a watch strap here, like modern watch. It's what we call like a, see, it's a gold watch here. You see here, there's a bar here. You can put string or chain to what do you call underneath this, underneath this part to attach it to your pocket. That's like a pocket watch. Or you can say a chain watch. Normally, pocket watch is more common, okay? Uh, so these are the things that use, the comb is used with the hair, right, for Della. And the fob chain is used with the, what do you call, with the pocket watch. And the trick, and what do you call, the irony is that without a hair, without hair, you can't use the comb. And without the watch, you can't use the fob chain. It would just be a chain, see? And the setting, do you notice the place? You have to be able to identify that, okay? The place is New York. Ah. So it's a big city even in the olden times. So there must be like a struggle in the cost of living for sure. You see, there's even the price here. A furnished flat at $8 per week. This might seem like just a small money in the today's standard. But in the old times, that's quite something like it's it's the amount of money that you have to work hard for to pay that okay that's why the state of the place you can say it's a shabby old and poor apartment a flat here see shabby old and poor you see the condition of the room you also see that they are <laughs> the room is quite cheap because it shows their financial status that they are not like millionaires they are not rich you can look at that from just one description here. And the time in 1900s, okay? And you even have more specific time, not just like uh, what year that is, but also what time of day. Well, it's actually in the afternoon until the evening. So that's just like less than a day. And of course, during Christmas Eve. Now, these are the pictures that shows New York in the 1900. Uh, by sometimes when you read novels, especially or stories from the old times, knowing the numbers of the year doesn't help you that much because we have different culture with the West. Like if you don't live in the New, in New York, when you say 1900, you can't imagine unless you do some research and find these pictures. Okay, you see how they wear their garments. Uh, you see how they live, uh, how crowded it is, and the state of the building. See here, ah. uh, so it's the same with what you call Western readers who have to read Thai stories. If, when when we say like uh, oh nang e yuk grung si yutia mater kapra e ki yon mela pai da kung lat na ko sin and then the western reader would feel like what I don't know about these ages I I can't imagine that but if you show them the pictures they can say oh okay now I know what you mean they could understand the stories more okay same to you. Okay, don't just give up because you don't know the time or just because it's happened in the past and you just disregard it. Sometimes the setting is really important to what you call not just how the stories are driven, but also the motives and the values of the characters. Huh? Now, think about social life in 1900. Well, new diversions of entertainment for middle class. Uh, so how can they amuse themselves? Well, they go to amusement parks. They go to movie theaters. They go to dance halls or even spectator sports. So actually fighting or like cockfighting uh, or some things with spectator sports. Uh, these are allowed during that time. Okay. And uh, with this is like how you describe when you do some research behind the stories or when the story takes place, you can use this to justify or clarify your analysis of why, what you call, why the character does this action, 
or think this way. Ah, oh, it's because with in 1900, the leisure time increasing, the working class also began to take a greater interest in fashion. So, so it's not just living from day to day, but the, but these characters can also care for themselves, care for their hairs, care to have possession like gold watch and fob chain, for example, when before maybe they could not. Huh? Also, an increasing commercialism of cultural activities at leisure became a marketable commodity. So, people, like from before, maybe they, they are just happy with uh, the four factors you need in your life. Uh, yeah, uh, what do you call it? Tinon, yeah, uh, medicine, uh, accommodation, food, and safety. That's it. Maybe they only want four. But in 1900, people want more now. Commercialism started to take effects. People start to want to started to want things maybe they cannot afford. Okay, not to mention here at oh, what do you call like uh, in in our time we all we always want things we cannot afford, but will you actually buy it and can you actually pay for it in the end? That's something to think about. Okay. So it focused on the objects and appearance of Della. See, that's why why like. If you read it in the present time, like not there's nothing or what do you call it? like it's just an ordinary story in it. Uh, but actually in that time like, it reflects that uh, why Della has to be worried about her hair. Or these days like what like see the the differences like the focus are different in different times, okay? Now, the climax, okay, can you identify the climax? Well, the climax of the story is near the end, right? When Jim and Della opens the gifts, because that's when, like, what do you call, uh, what they've overcome will bear fruit now, will really take effects. Like, it's the, the revelation. Like, if it's a murder mystery, like, the rising action would be the investigation. Oh, Mr. A. And then the climax is when the detective reveals that, the culprit, the bad guy, the murderer is third. Uh, and then he explained why he thinks that way. See, that's the climax. Uh -huh. And the theme. Can you tell me the theme? Uh, theme, I already told you from the previous clip, main idea of the story. Maybe you find more than one theme. Uh, but normally, okay, normally when, when the question asks what is the theme of the story, there, there might be like the parenthesis main theme of the story. We only just want what is clearest. What is the most prominent lesson, main idea that you get from reading this? Well, it's about sacrificing the things that they both cherish for others. See, it's sacrificial love. So normally when they ask about theme, your answer should be in noun phrase. Okay. Noun phrase, because it's the thing, it's the object. The main theme is, see, it's an object. Don't just say the main theme is in the 1900. Many people give gifts to each other. That's just like a sentence. Like, uh, that's just like a circumstance unrelated to the core of the story, okay? So, sacrificial love. Also, materials are not as important as true love. See, these people, they worship love, so they are willing to sacrifice their materials to, what do you call, to really give their loved ones what they want. And then the meaning of giving is with the action, not object. So here, we know that at first, the purpose of their sacrifice is to get the object, but actually, they love each other more in the end, not because of the act object itself. Because without the hair, how can you use a comb? Like it's, it's meaningless. But the emphasis on the action, you see, not the objects. Next, you may wonder why the title of the story is called The Gift of the Magi, right? You, you might not be familiar with this word, the Magi, but if you look it up, sometimes you have to do some research, you know. Uh, the Magi is actually three wise men or three kings which were in the gospel of Matthew and Christian tradition. See, they are a group of distinguished foreigners who visit Jesus after his birth bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
Well, you see, uh, so unless you are familiar with Western culture or at least Christianity context, you might not what do you call see the what do you call the connection with the Christian side, but because you see the setting is during the Christmas festival and Christmas they give gifts to each other. The Christmas season also relates to Christianity, uh, and with this one, gift of the and you see that the gift of the Magi, they're quite valuable during that time. Okay, gold, frankincense, and myrrh are very valuable during the olden times, but they're comparing that uh, these gifts compared to Della's and James gifts um, might not have like the same value in the eyes of others, right? That oh, just call me ah, just fob chain, hello. But like there maybe like the author is like what do you call it like, implying that the value of the gift might not be like might depends on the receiver, not like the value of it in the market, okay? Uh, and with this one, you're going to learn this word again, symbolism in the story. Ah, so การใช้สัญลักษณ์ในเรื่อง symbolism in the story. Okay, so if they ask you, okay, what do you think are the symbols in the story? You have to pick up the objects, okay, or the color, the things, the actual thing, นะคะ that you can that is stated in the story. นะ you have to describe. How does this thing relate to an idea outside the story, or or could be an idea, could be like a concrete thing, abstract thing, but it doesn't mean what it appears to be. Okay, and like for so for like this one, you when you see this, look at how these characters interact with the objects in the story. Ah, uh, you see there are pennies, there are letter box. There's an electric button. There's a gray cat walking a gray fence in the gray background backyard. See, look at how these objects are interacted with or are described. This could be symbols if you think it relates to something. It is there intentionally by the author to represent something else. Okay, one thing represent something else. That thing symbolizes third. Okay. That's the connection you have to make. Could be a gold watch. Could be long hair, fob chains. See, lots of items here. Comb, old brown jacket and hat, for example. So look at these things and maybe notice what could it symbolizes. Okay, what could these things symbolize?